This week we're looking at number seven in our series on education. We're talking about worship in education. And those two things interrelate with each other. Worship brings education and education as we understand about God brings worship as we say, God, I'm so thankful for what you've done for sharing with me the truth about yourself and what you've done. Some good quotes for this time. David Shepherd, I'm called to worship a God I cannot see, but not to submit to a God I cannot know and prove. We're not to be saying, oh, well, re religion, you just don't think about that. You just have to have faith or something like that. No, God wants us to think about things, which is part of what education is really all about. Worship changes the worshipper into the image of the one worship, said Jack Hayford. Believe that. We become what we worship and admire, just like that. We just become like that because we admire something, we become like that thing or like that person. We're given some interesting material, Daniel 3, the worship of that golden image that Nebuchadnezzar was forcing everybody to do and the three Hebrew young men, perhaps teenagers even at that time, refused to do so. Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah said, no, we're not going to bow down. And even if our God does not rescue us, O King, we're not going to bow down and worship because we know the truth and we know the true God. And when we're also given material there in Revelation, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. He had the eternal good news to announce to those who lived on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. He cried out in a loud voice, Give God reverence and glory for the time of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Worship. Why? Because he is God. And don't you have something to be thankful for? Don't you want to worship God? That's really what it's all about. As we come to know God through the educational process, let's say it that way, not through necessarily school or whatever, but through learning, by reading our Bibles, by being in church, by educating ourselves, we want to worship because that is our human expression of delight, of appreciation for what God has done. And uh, here I want to mention Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island. He wrote, forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. And I have to admit that I probably got some people in trouble by quoting this one time. Some students came to me and asked about compulsory worship in our educational institutions and I did mention this. And we should make our worships, wherever they are, as interesting and as unmissable as possible. Not compelling people by threat of sanctions, but inviting them in. I understand all the challenges. I, I, don't misunderstand me, but forced worship, if you really are just forcing people to go even when they don't want to, when it's terribly oppressive and boring and frustrating and uninteresting and whatever, no, forced worship, that is not what God wants. It stinks in his nostrils, he said in his connection there. God finds that repugnant. So worship must always come from within ourselves as a delight, something that we want to do because we've discovered the kind of person God really is and that we love him for that. That is really what we are supposed to be doing. Look at those Psalms of David. Look at all those expressions of worship when people discover that God isn't the kind of person the devil's made him out to be, but he is truly loving and kind and that he can heal us from all the damage that sin has done in our lives. Listen to these words from Ellen White in the comments from this time. 
We need to educate and train the mind so that we shall have an intelligent faith and have an understanding friendship with Jesus. Do you see those words? Intelligent faith, understanding friendship. That's what education brings to our worship, what our worship brings to education. May we all discover just that.